The stereo net shown here is commonly used to study geometric relationships between lines and planes. Used for this, it's commonly used in structural geology, and actually it has applications to other aspects of geology. Hence, it becomes very important that you understand what the stereo net represents. So I'm showing it here, the stereo net, below a plastic hemisphere that portrays what's really happening you know, in the stereo net, when you use a stereo net, what it's really representing, and I'm going to try to impress that upon you with this. What is presently shown here in the hemisphere is a plane that strikes to the north, right, in the direction of my pencil. That's the strike. By right arm rule, it would be a strike to, the, to due north. The dip is due east. This, this black line up actually represents the dip direction of the plane. So it's due east. The plane itself dips about 60 degrees to the east, such that the black perimeter of the plane should approximate the great circle representing a 60 degree dip. With that, the pole to the plane over here, which is perpendicular to the plane, the pole plunges 30 degrees due west in the opposite direction of the dip of the plane. That is due to the fact that the pole is perpendicular to the plane. So it'll always be true, for instance, here the plane dips 60 degrees to the east, the pole plunges 30 degrees to the west. Those are complementary angles, they add up to 90 degrees. That will always be true. The plunge of the pole is the complement to the, to the dip of the plane. I'm going to try to manipulate this plane such that the plane becomes vertical and you'll see what becomes of the of the pole. The pole will come up to a horizontal position hopefully as I rotate the plane to be vertical. Well, let's call that good enough. I'm going to remove that. So hopefully that's positioned correctly to portray a plane that again ha still has a strike of due north, but the dip is vertical, right? And as such, the dip could be expressed as to the east or the west, it really doesn't matter. Since the dip is 90 degrees, the dip direction becomes rather irrelevant. It's either east or west, assuming the plane itself has a strike that is due north. Likewise, really, the strike could be expressed as due south. The right arm rule becomes ambiguous and becomes rather irrelevant in this particular case. All right, but with the plane vertical, the point to be made here is that the pole is horizontal. Right, again, complementary angles. The plunge of the pole is zero in this case, while the dip of the plane is 90 degrees. They add up to 90. Now, Likewise, that pole could have been portrayed to the east. It would have made no difference. Here I've replaced the stereo net and just kind of blanked it out because I'm about to rotate the sphere and I think it would become confusing. The rotation I'm about to do would normally be accomplished with the stereo net by rotating the overlay and the stereo net would remain stationary. Uh, what I'm showing right now is the plane returned such that it, it strikes due north, it dips 60 degrees to the east, the pole plunges uh, 30 degrees to the west. Just as the dip direction is 090, 0, 0, 
the trend of the pole is 270. I'm now going to rotate the hemisphere, right, part of the model, such that the strike will be 040. I hope that's about right. Yeah. My intention now is for the strike to be approximately 040. Even if it doesn't look perfectly that way, that's, that's my intention. Strike is 040. The dip is off in this direction, the dip direction, right? And that will be 130. The dip is still 60 degrees. So the right arm expression here is 04060, right? 04060. It's understood that the dip direction is to the southeast with that expression. Specifically, the dip direction is 40 degrees south of due east at 130 if the strike, like I say, is 40 degrees east of due north. The pole plunges off to the northwest at 310, right? The trend, I should say, is 310. That's the compass direction of the pole. And the pole has a plunge of 30 degrees. Again, complementary to the dip of 60 degrees for the plane. So let's, let's change it up again, maintaining our 60 degree dip. Let's The strike of the plane would have to be expressed as something like 160, right? The strike, 160 following the right arm rule. You know, here's my little Lego lady again. If she faces that direction, 160, her right arm over here is pointing off to the southwest. And that's the dip of the plane now. The, the plane dips to the southwest. So by right arm rule, we would have to express the strike to the southeast if our right arm is to point to the southwest in the correct direction for the dip. Cool. Now we have a plane with a strike of 160. The dip is 60. Um, the dip direction is in the compass direction 250. That comes from the fact that the strike is 20 degrees short of due south, if you will. Therefore, the dip direction must be 20 degrees short of due west. Okay, the pole then must be in the direction 070, given these specifics, right? And that, if you think about it, is just 20 degrees short of due east. The pole plunges still 30 degrees in that direction, 070, off to the northeast. Maintaining that strike, right, that strike direction of 160, let me attempt to bring the plane up to a shallower dip to demonstrate other things here. So I'm rotating the plane up, if you will, to a So here you should notice that what happened, the the great circle, remember the great circle representation of the plane right here? The dark perimeter of the, of the, of the foam core board here, the plane? As I, as I made the dip shallower, the position of that great circle actually swung outward toward the primitive great circle. Okay. So that's one thing to note. The, the little dot here representing the pole swung instead to a steeper angle, right? The pole now plunges about 60 degrees off to the northeast, while the plane dips 30 degrees to the southwest. So again, the great circle is coming up to a, a position closer to the primitive great circle, and the dot representing the pole has changed position. Let me so it changed position from something right about here, right, the end of my pencil, and it rotated this way down to its present position, indicating a steeper angle for the pole to the plane. Again, 
That is due to the, the, the plane itself having a shallower dip. Trying to maintain a, a strike of 160, let me attempt to bring this plane up to even a shallower angle. In fact, we'll go up to a horizontal angle, perhaps, if I can manage that. You'll notice that what has happened, and hopefully I've got this set up such that it, it has that appearance. The great circle representing the plane for this horizontal plane is now at the primitive great circle of the stereo net. Right? This is the primitive great circle of the stereo net. So it should have that appearance. The uh, pole now is vertical. It's down here, dead center in the stereo net. It should be if it's vertical. So horizontal planes have vertical poles. Now, in this case, the strike is rather irrelevant because the plane really, well, it has a zero degree dip. So the strike, again, it, it could be it could be anything. It's really rather undefined if the plane has a zero degree dip. To, uh, I guess, to further sort of uh, uh, make sure you understand what you were just looking at, let me just video this as I take this apart. All right, so that was my plane, right, and the pole. I hope you can see it. This was the hemisphere suspended above a stereo net. All right. I had this as kind of a, a holder for the hemisphere. I'll put this over here. And again, this is my plane, right, and its pole. And all I need to do now, let me just take this now away from... And this, of course, is the underlying stereo net. 